In the 20 years I've been practicing radiology, I've been seeing a dramatic increase in the diseases, um, most of which are self-inflicted, it seems, whether it's emphysema, plaque in the coronary arteries, visceral fat, liver fat. And, I, and most of these people are trying to follow conventional guidelines. And I developed a real interest in seeing how uh, the food we eat, nutrition, can impact some of the findings we see in imaging. And then finally, if we could use those images at a, as an educational and kind of motivational tool, sit down with people, show them their images, explain what we're seeing, and hopefully use that to encourage them to choose a healthy diet. And so we're going to be looking at a number of images today. But uh, we'll get going here by showing you what uh, breakfast looks like on x-ray. <laughs> <laughs> and on the, this is your typical high-carb breakfast. We have Kellogg's Corn Flakes with some skim milk. We have a typical slice of wheat toast and a cup of orange juice. And so the x-ray shows kind of the cereal somewhat opaque, and the toast is pretty radiolucent. And surprisingly, the orange juice is actually quite dense, which is surprising. Perhaps they fortified it with a lot of calcium. <laughs> and so here's our low-carb breakfast. And now for the pure paleo people, we'll get rid of the whole milk. Um, but so we got a couple eggs. We got our half a piece of uh, avocado and a few slices of uh, bacon. And uh, this came out at about, without the, without the milk, at about six carbs. And uh, the high carb uh, breakfast is at about 80. So that's what they look like side by side. So, well, what does this mean? Well, it really doesn't mean much of anything. <laughs> Except you can't diagnose a healthy breakfast by x-ray. <laughs> Although, if you turn the KVP up high enough, you could probably kill any bacteria that might have found their way into your bacon and your eggs. But um, more advanced medical imaging can teach us a great deal of the metabolic effects of a poor diet. And we'll be looking at that uh, going forward here. So Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soils and offered to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked at, with, that, uh, with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look at with favor. So if God was a high fat God, who are we to question that? All right, most of you have probably seen these trends. Uh, it's not looking good. Um, dramatic changes over the last 20 years, and it's getting worse. You know, these charts were based on BMI, and most of you know the BMI equation. Height over, uh, excuse me, mass over height squared. And using those parameters, the BMI over 25 is considered overweight and 30 is obese. And by those criteria, two thirds of us now in the US are overweight and a third are obese, and the kids are not faring a whole lot better. 16% at this point are obese. And although BMI is a decent parameter to use looking at population levels, it's not particularly accurate when we look at individuals. And it doesn't take into account you know, body composition or where in the body the fat is deposited, which is critical. Because where the fat is in our bodies makes a huge difference on our metabolic profile. So maybe the problem is we're just all too short. <laughs> Okay, so two pr uh, predominant uh, locations that we have are fat deposited. One is the subcutaneous fat, or right below our skin. It has systemic drainage and not particularly associated with a whole lot of cardiovascular risk other than overall weight gain. As opposed, however, to the deep fat, the visceral fat, um, that has a different drainage. That goes through the portal vein and then it directly exposes the liver to those triglycerides that we have in our belly. And that definitely has a increased risk for a lot of metabolic problems, insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, to name a few. So people think about fat sometimes as just this inert blob that sits in our belly and does nothing but weigh us down. But in actuality, it's a very active uh, endocrine organ. Um, fat is uh, continually deposited and redistributed throughout the body. Those with elevated cortisol levels actually uh, have problems with uh, the, the deep deposition of visceral fat. And the fat that's deep, too, also is a little more unusual than the sub-Q fat in that it has more receptors for cortisol, and it has an enzyme that actually converts inactive cortisone to cortisol. So you have a tremendous amount of uh, cortisone that's making an impact on that visceral fat. 
So along with the macrophages that are embedded within that fat, they secrete a lot of inflammatory cytokines that also increase our risk for chronic disease. So BMI wasn't so good. So we tried to find a, maybe a different easy parameter to look at uh, visceral adiposity. And one of them was just using waist circumference. It's easy, cheap. And in men, taking it around the umbilicus, actually it's halfway between the lower rib and the iliac crest, um, over 40 is considered to have uh, visceral adiposity in women are greater than 35. And you can also use weight hip ratios as well. But there's a problem with that too that we're gonna look at in a moment. Oh, and finally, you know, the, that waist circumference is part of the metabolic syndrome, one of the five criteria along with hypertension, triglycerides, HDL, and elevated blood sugar. So just to orient people who are not real familiar with uh, cross-sectional imaging, this is a picture of a CT scan. Pretend that you're standing at the person's feet and you're looking at their head. And uh, the person's right is to, as you look at it, to your left, and it's opposite, and on the right is the patient's left. And they're laying on their back, and the white area at the bottom is the spine, and then the front of the belly, or the kind of the um umbilicus area, is anterior. And so this person has actually a normal distribution of fat. And in, on CT, fat is black. And so you can see the rim of black uh, surrounding the perimeter, and that's a very normal amount of subcutaneous fat. This person has very little visceral fat, tiny little triangles of dark that you can see interposed between bowel. So this would be the normal fat distribution. And the problem with the waist circumference, now that you're oriented, this is uh, eight different patients, and this is an MRI. And rather than the fat being black that we saw on CT, the fat is actually white on MRI. And this are eight different individuals, all with the same waist circumference. So the problem is in the, in the very first one, they have very little visceral fat. and the bottom, the very last one, they have a tremendous amount. Now, this waist circumference in this individual comes in at 38. They're going to be passed as non-obese using the waist circumference technique. But the actuality, this person in the bottom here would be somebody we'd call TOFI, or thin on the outside, fat on the inside. They have a lot of visceral fat and would be at increased metabolic risk compared to the person in the, the people uh, earlier on in this slide. So, Waist circumference may be better, but certainly not optimal. And again, just to go over a little normal fat distribution. And again, when I say normal, this would be a middle-aged woman. She has a fair bit of fat in the buttocks area and the hips. This is normal distribution. And again, very little visceral fat. In the first image, we're at the level of the kidneys and stomach. You can see very little fat there. As we come down to the level of the umbilicus, a little more. And then at the level of the pelvic bones, um, a little more too, but a nice normal fat distribution for a woman. So the apple and pear. Most of you have probably seen this, but in men, we, this android configuration, we tend to collect our fat higher up, again around the belly button. That is the area where we get this, the visceral fat that is of concern, as opposed to women who collect, tend to collect the weight further down on the hips and the buttocks area. But as women become postmenopausal and estrogen drops, they tend to develop a, a male distribution pattern as well. So here's the apple belly, and this is a coronal scout CT. So you kind of, just the outline of a tremendous amount of fat centrally located. And this is what this looks like on CT at the level of the kidneys. This is a enhanced image with uh, IV contrast, and the white areas you're seeing are is oral contrast material within some of the bowel loops. Tremendous amount of fat surrounding the organs. This is the same thing with MRI. Again, now fat is white on MR. So this is basically just a sea of fat surrounding all these bowel loops. And kind of a thin rim of uh, subcutaneous fat, but the bulk of this fat is obviously very central. And just a comparison, kind of a normal versus markedly increased visceral fat levels. Okay, as compared to the pear-shaped, and this is again a coronal scout, and you can see the weight, uh, most of the uh, fat is lower down among the hips and buttocks, and that's what this looks like on CT. Again, very little fat located centrally in the visceral compartment, but a tremendous amount, kind of almost an inner tube worth of uh, fat in the periphery there. And again, higher up at the level of the kidneys, same kind of thing. Little bits of fat scattered here and there in the visceral compartment, but lots uh, in the periphery. And this is a combo, a woman who's fortunate enough to have both. And 
collected it down low, but she's probably stressed, a lot of cortisol and getting that central deposition. And one last, uh, just kind of going to normal versus a uh, obese uh, BMI. So I mentioned earlier just this TOFI configuration. There's a couple different subtypes. And again, those are people with normal BMI, but they tend to collect a lot of visceral fat centrally, and their metabolic markers tend to be elevated, as compared to the fat fit, who by BMI criteria are obese, but their metabolic markers are normal. And really the only way to differentiate those two is with uh, cross-sectional I mean, or a technique called DEXA, which I'll comment on here shortly. So when we do cross-sectional imaging, one of the other benefits of not only looking at visceral fat, we get to look at the other organs. And um, one of real concern when we're talking about visceral adiposity is what's happening in the liver. Because the liver kind of takes the brunt of a lot of what's going on with that visceral fat. Again, it's a reversible condition. Fatty acids are deposited in the form of triglycerides within the liver cells. Um, when I first started years ago, I mean, I saw a fatty liver maybe three or four times a month. Now I'm seeing them three or four times a day. And when I saw them before, it was basically in alcoholics and people who are on steroids. And now almost all of them are people who are on a high sugar, high glucose, and particularly high fructose uh, diet. This can progress on to something called NASH, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and then a proportion of those actually advance onto cirrhosis. And again, just this mechanism where the fatty acids through the portal vein are exposing the hepatocytes to this triglyceride load, resulting in this lipotoxicity to the hepatocytes and insulin resistance. So this is what a fatty liver looks like. And we use the spleen, which is the other organ that you can see to the right, as a reference point. And the liver and spleen should be about the same density or attenuation. In this person, this is an enhanced image. Uh, central next to the spine, you can see the enhanced aorta. And the bright areas in the liver are just enhancing vessels, the portal and hepatic veins. But the attenuation of this liver is markedly lower compared to the spleen. So when I see this, I know, you know the whole thing. Their fatty liver, insulin resistance. You know, I always try to look at their labs and see what it is. Usually the LFTs are up. Usually the fasting glucose is up. You know, I look at the medications. Frequently they're on you know, you know, metformin or other medications. And it's just constant. We see it many, many times a day now. Um, just for comparison purposes, on the left is normal. And you can see the liver attenuation is about the same as the spleen in this particular case to the left. And again, the fatty liver on the right. We also can see and diagnose a fatty liver with ultrasound. And it's a nice tool in that it's uh, much more widely available, it's inexpensive, and it doesn't use any radiation. And um, we use the kidney rather than the spleen as a reference point with ultrasound. And uh, looking at the liver parenchyma, uh, the echogenicity should be the same as the kidney in the normal condition. In the fatty or cirrhotic liver, it's much brighter, what we call echogenic, uh, compared to the kidney. And we do this a lot for screening. Um, we get many times a day, people are sent in, and you know, the doctors are wondering if there's a fatty liver. They probably saw something perhaps on their uh, biomarkers and had concern. So what I wanted to do is see if I could use these imaging findings to motivate people to make these tough changes in their diet that frequently happen. And so I ran a one-year study, I called it the Medivat study, and we uh, enrolled uh, 30 people in this, and they were placed on a kind of Mediterranean-style, higher-fat diet. And um, we did a baseline and then three, six, and 12-month imaging studies, and we looked at their metabolic markers uh, throughout that time period. They uh, met with a nutritionist, and they were given, they kept a food journal, at least they were supposed to keep an accurate food journal. <laughs> and uh, they were given a pedometer just to get a rough estimate of their activity level. So uh, kind of conventional Mediterranean style diet, and again, regardless of, or depending on who you ask, that can vary widely. But it was basically a vegetable and fruit-based uh, diet, um, predominantly um, uh, monounsaturated fat, but certainly saturated fat was a definitely component of this. Uh, cheese, avocados, and so forth. Uh, saturated fat um, with uh, red meat on occasion, uh, seafood, the grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds that we typically use, uh, see with a Mediterranean-style diet. And then the goal was to get them down to at least 30% carbs. 
It would have been nice to get them lower than that, but they were all starting out at about 50 to 60%, so this was at least going in the right direction, so you know, lower carb and trying to get that fat increased. So unfortunately, we had a tremendous dropout. We only got nine people completed the 12-month trial. Um, five of the nine experienced significant visceral fat reduction, and of those five, four of them improved the appearance and, uh, of their liver and their liver function tests. Three didn't experience really much change in the visceral fat, but did improve their biomarkers, and one actually increased, but this individual didn't really follow the program. <laughs> okay, so this is my poster child from the study. This is Shannon, and Shannon's uh, MR on the left was when he started. And Shannon had a tremendous amount of visceral fat, tremendous amount, or not a tremendous, but enough subcutaneous fat, but the bulk of his fat was central. Two months later, just over two months, this is what Shannon looked like. And I say after MD, but this had nothing to do with a medical doctor. This had everything to do with 36 ounces of Mountain Dew that he got rid of. And he made other changes, but this was the biggie. This was the biggie. He reduced his visceral fat compartment by 35%, and he lost about 25 pounds. So that was his visceral fat. This is what Shannon did to his liver. Shannon started off on the left with a liver packed full of triglyceride. Two months later, he normalized. It was phenomenal. And when I sat down with Shannon and his wife and showed them these pictures, there was just this look of awe. I mean, they were so, um, I guess, grateful to be able to see the images and were so inspired to continue on with the program, getting to actually see that they could be empowered to make these changes in the organs and their function based on what they were doing with their diet. So it was a very powerful tool for them, and I found this to be the case with the other people that went through the study as well. And again, you know, this has been shown many times that nearly all of the metabolic markers that we look for improve on a high-fat diet. HDL goes up. LDL and cholesterol tend to be a little more variable, but generally LDL type A particles, the non-anthrogenic ones, go up. Particle number goes down. Triglycerides, sugar, HbA1c goes down, and inflammatory markers improve. And that is indeed just what we saw with Shannon here. And I use him as a benchmark, but the other people who completed it who were successful had similar findings. And he um, dropped his cholesterol and LDL, but HDL... Um, it didn't budge much, but 45 wasn't too bad, but over the course of the year, that went up. Triglycerides, surprisingly, were not that high. With what his belly looked like and his liver, I would have thought they would have been much greater, but he dropped those a little. CRP came down. Look at what happened to his liver function tests, AST and ALT, and he kept those down throughout the course of the year, and then his blood sugars improved as well. So it just was a learning tool for me to kind of appreciate that you know, one of the th areas I think we fail in radiology is patients never get to see their images. Um, it's just kind of the logistics of what we do, but they come in, they get imaged, we put, uh, you know, dictate the report, it goes to the doctor, and if it's normal, you know, they'll tell the patient it was normal. If it's abnormal, um, they'll tell them what was abnormal, but they never actually get to see it. And I think the impact that seeing visually what's going on can make a big impact on peop pe uh, people's understanding of what's going on and motivate them to make changes. So, again, what have we learned? You know, 1963, categorically, that the storage of fat and therefore the production and maintenance of obesity cannot take place unless glucose is being metabolized. And since glucose cannot be used by most tissues, well, the presence of insulin can all be categorically stated that obesity is impossible in the absence of adequate concentrations of insulin. So, you know, we've known this 1963 and even earlier, so it's just, Amazing that the science is just met with such resistance. Um, what we listened to Nina yesterday, um, there's just powerful forces out there that want to keep telling us that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie, and that the way to uh, lose weight is just by, you know, having a little more willpower. And clearly, it's not the case. So we just, um, you know, fight the good fight and keep spreading the gospel. So. Michelangelo required just a little larger slab of marble for version two. <laughs> and then, you know, well, why would you walk when you can drive? <laughs> okay, so 
you know, the reality with CTNMR is a great tool. It's kind of the gold standard, but it's expensive. Uh, there's radiation with CT. So what are the other ways we can actually evaluate uh, body fat? Um, you know, skinfold caliper measurements is a long track record. In uh, skilled hands, it's very reproducible and accurate. Um, they target different areas that they measure, and then they come with total percent body fat. Um, and again, that's what it is, total body percent. It doesn't tell you what the compartments are, where, how much visceral fat versus subcutaneous, but you do get a reading for overall fat. Bioelectrical impedance is also a tool that's more widely available. This is one that's commonly found in the health clubs and spas, and they use um, this uh, low dose of electricity that passes through the body. And again, based on the differential between lean tissue and fat, they can come up with uh, total percent uh, body fat, but again, it doesn't tell you where the fat is. Hydrostatic weighing, um, very accurate tool, again, looking at overall body fat. They look at the weight people are on dry land, and then they put them in the dunk tank and see what they weigh and calculate uh, body fat based on that. Generally unavailable uh, in a lot of places, although this, this entrepreneur to the right uh, uh, has a dunk tank that he uh, has in his truck. So I don't know, we may be seeing more and more of those. <laughs> and again, the gold standards that we've already discussed. Um, in my study, we didn't have a, the automatic software, so it required a lot of detailed tracing to get the fat measurements. And same guy did it, very skilled, so I think we got some pretty good results. But most of the automatic features are uh, kind of confined to academic centers. And again, much more expensive uh, than the other techniques we just looked at. And of course, CT requires radiation. But I think one of the new uh, modalities that is going to be real uh, exciting going forward is a technique called DEXA. And this was originally used uh, to look at, uh, for osteoporosis in postmenopausal women, looking at bone mineral density. And it still is. But the newer techniques now can actually look at um, both uh, protein or lean muscle and bone and then calculate uh, fat, both where it's located centrally and peripherally, as well as they can look at um, basically fat throughout the body and give you percentages on extremities and where it's located in specific regions of the body. This is a DEXA scan. The yellow is fat, red tends to be or lean muscle, and then the blue is bone. And gives you a very detailed readout. You know, you probably can't see that real well. But again, um, real specific on how much lean protein you have. And if you're a bodybuilder, you may have an extra pound of uh, muscle on one side versus the other. So if you're that in tune to your body, you can kind of maybe do a couple extra reps on the right side the next time you're at the gym. But again, you can do um, calculate visceral adipose tissue here. Again, it's cheap. Uh, it's going to be more widely inexpensive. You can do one of these scans for about 100 bucks. And um, we use this then to follow people, you know, as they're making these changes in their diet and their activity level and seeing what uh, impact we can make. So again, here, here's your low-carb six-pack ab on CT. So you got... <laughs> The two, four, six, the rectus muscles. So they're enhancing your image. So, so in summary, um, uh, you know, I, unfortunately, we can't diagnose a good breakfast with x-ray, but we can use imaging, uh, more sophisticated imaging, to get a better sense of what's happened metabolically with the food we eat. And I think we can use the imaging findings as a real powerful and motivating tool to get people to make healthy changes in their life. Thank you.